Let me ask you this. What in the world are you doing here today? I mean, why are you here? Why did you take the time out today from your busy lives to gather here and, and come to this place? I mean, you know, didn't you have something better to do? I mean, it's the end of the summer. It's a holiday weekend. Why'd you come here today? Uh, you know, didn't you have something better? I mean, most people, most people think they got something better to do than come. So, well, you know, studies have shown, as so we look at people and why they come to church and why they make church a part of their life, that there's sort of some groups of people who have some confusion about what it is that uh, church is, is all about. They have some erroneous uh, thoughts. And kind of giving you four categories of sort of erroneous ways of thinking of, that people have about church. And there's a group called, we'll call them the, the dropouts. Uh, they don't make speeches or lead groups out of the church. They just kind of quietly come and, and quietly disappear. They join the church with aching hearts, and they disappear with aching hearts. They might, might put blame on hypocritical people that they see around them, or legalism, or the music wasn't right, or the pastor was all wrong, and for whatever reason, it just kind of didn't work out, and nobody seemed to even recognize that their problem was there, and that their hearts were aching, and so they kind of leave with an attitude of, as they think about it, of either all these people are phonies, or something's wrong with me. For some reason, God just doesn't seem to be very real to me, and they just kind of kind of drop out. And the second group, call them joiners. I mean, they, they really think religion's a good thing. I mean, this whole church and religion is a good thing. They remember their, their parents did it. They've sort of done it for generation and generations. And it's kind of like, you know, joining the Rotary Club. I mean, it's something you do. I mean, just responsible people do this. And they believe in participating. And they stay in church. And they're stalwart members. And they, however, kind of never really embrace a real heart for God. Uh, they contribute money and time, and they're good people in many ways, and faithful and activistic people, and want to stir the church into, into motion. But at the heart of it, though, at their hearts, their hearts are not really drawn to God. and They don't have that warmth of relationship with God. And frankly, if Jesus showed up, they'd be annoyed at the, at the disturbance that it would cause to the, to the good healthy flow of things. Oh, and there's another group. We'll call them enthusiasts. Some people who forever are expecting that the answer is just right the, over there somewhere. It's, it's just around the corner. It's in the, in the next class. Every movement, every organization, new speakers and new books and new web pages, and it, it catches their imagination, and they think, here it is. This is, this is that missing ingredient. So they buy the books, and they go to all the right resources and pages. And, but if, if you look at their past, you find that they actually have a record of kind of being interested in these things and activities and pages and, and, and all of that, but they don't really ultimately connect with a heart relationship with God and a significant relationship with God's people in the church family. And here's a fourth group. Call these the, the hardliners. They appear super confident, but underneath the surface, they're terribly in need of affirmation and, and a sense of well-being and prominence and, and being okay. They're, they're kind of like the enthusiasts, but they they don't move on very much to new things. Rather, they like to settle down into more of a defensive posture and contend for the things that they think are the indisputable things that, that need to, to be what they are. Sometimes they're fundamentalists, or sometimes they're the, 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 the charismatics, or sometimes they're, they're just people with a, 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 a legalistic viewpoint, or whatever it is that that's kind of their thing. It, it's really what the church really should be about. And so uh, they're champions of these kinds of values. But at the heart, again, they don't really have at the core a warmth of heart relationship with God and a commitment to follow hard after him and in relationship with people in the body of Christ. And so today, as we finish our series in the book of Psalms, and we go to the 84th Psalm, which is a psalm of ascent, is what we call these category, this category of psalm, we ask the applicational question rising out of it, 
Why go to church? Why be a person of worship? Why be a person who connects with God and with God's people? Why invest in a corporate gathering of God's people? And so today, as we explore that idea, just very really briefly today, what I want to do is talk with you about this idea of what does it mean to have. See, all these other groups of people, it's not like they're bad people or something, but they're missing this heart for God, this really deep heart relationship with God and a passion to connect that heart relationship with God in coordination and, and, and service with people around them on a regular basis. So, what does it mean to have a heart for God? And what does it mean to be, in the terms I'm going to use today, people who have a heart to be on a pilgrimage, even to know God? So what does it mean to have a heart for God? Uh, David was credited by God in the Scriptures, in spite of his many public flaws, which we're very much aware of, great, massive public flaws that he had about his personality and behavior at various times, and yet the scriptures say that God pronounced him as a person with a real heart for God. So it would seem that that would be really important for us to understand, that it would be a high value to seek what does it mean to be a person with a heart for God, and I want to be that kind of person. And it seems to me that some of the material in this brief little Psalm 84 is one of those primary places in Scripture where this concept is, is addressed. Again, Psalm 84 is within this category of psalms. We've been talking about these different categories of psalms and working through the book, uh, God's Playlist, as we call it, of songs. God's Playlist, we see these different categories of worship psalms and teaching psalms and, and uh, um, uh, psalms that even call down God's judgment on, on, on those who are uh, apart from God and, uh, and alienated from God and hostile to him. And so this is a category of psalms that we call a psalm of ascent. Songs that were sung often by pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. When you went to Jerusalem, we always see in the scripture, it says, Let's, let us go up to Jerusalem. It didn't matter what direction you came from. When you came to Jerusalem, you would go through a valley and you ascend up to the, to the, to the city and then to the temple, uh, the mount on the city, in the city. Then, and in the Old Testament way of thinking, that's where God was. That's where God was located, in the temple, particularly in the holy place, in that most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was behind the curtain. That was the localized presence of God. And three times a year, if you were faithful and you, you, you were a person with a heart for God and, and obedient to God, you would make a pilgrimage for the major feasts that would be celebrated in Jerusalem to go there and meet with God in a festive occasion. And so people would be traveling from all over the place, all over Palestine and even beyond as the years would go by, people would be traveling to Jerusalem. The roads would be filled with people. And as you got closer and closer to Jerusalem, you can imagine that the traffic became heavier on the roads with other pilgrims going. And they were known to sing as they're going up to Jerusalem these psalms of ascent, these psalms that talk about going and worshiping and meeting and doing business with God. It was during one of these, of course, after it, as the travelers were leaving to go home. You know the story of Jesus getting detached from his parents when he was a boy. And, of course, his parents, Mary and Joseph, thought that he was with some of the others from their traveling party along the roads. And then when they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem. And, of course, he's in the temple uh, with the teachers. And, and he, he, he looks like he's confused. Well, why didn't you? Why didn't you know? This is, this is where I would be. But it's in that whole coming and going thing that that whole little story takes place. You know, I really wonder what percentage of Jewish people in those times actually did come to worship for those feasts. Or how many of them stayed home to care for the animals or kind of maintain life. I mean, you, you, you can imagine like if, if everyone in every village just kind of left everything behind. and you know, I, I don't know how that exactly worked or, or what numbers of people came. Certainly not everyone did. I'm not sure how that exactly worked, but I can imagine that even in those times as well, there were folk of, you know, should I, should I go to the feast? Should I, I don't know, where does that fit in with other things that I'm doing? And, and 
sort of the same process, I think, goes through a lot of people's hearts and minds about should I connect to the church? I mean, they need, they need people to help with this and they, that ministry and David dig in with youth and children's ministries. Maybe I should do that, but I got these, you know, I, I don't know. It must, what went through their minds would be similar to what goes through in people's minds today. But to go and to leave where they were in ancient times where you'd have to walk, you'd have to take a journey, there's no mechanical public transportation, you maybe were coming from, in many cases, quite some distance over the dusty roads and so on. It what must have been a major commitment, an upset of the regular ebb and flow of life to make a pilgrimage happen. And so to do that, it was not something that you took lightly, but rather it would take a lot of planning and a lot of effort and details to manage all of the traveling arrangements and so on. For many, it was kind of like a camping out experience. And we see this some with, uh, you know, like the final week there of, of, of Christ's ministry on the earth. And, and you see that the folks are like, camped all around the city and, and so on. And so it really wasn't a convenient thing probably to do. And uh, it probably was too inconvenient for many. So the psalm is basically going to say, blessed is the one and, 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 and good is the person who has a heart for pilgrimage, who has a heart to be a person that's moving to go and to meet and to have a warmth of relationship with God and his people. Here's how the psalm begins. Many of these verses are familiar to us from worship psalms, songs, and so forth that we sing. It says in verses 1 and 2, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. In an Old Testament times again, that localized place of going to meet with God was there at the, the temple. And there was kind of a glow to it with the lights. It was up high, the, 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 the uh, torches and the light that would come from it. And, of course, the most holy place was the place that only the high priest entered in the most holy place only once a year. And so going to the temple was truly an experience of going to God to worship him and doing so in a very physical and kind of way. Today, in New Testament times from Pentecost and, and afterwards, of course, the localized presence of God is not at some place over in Israel or something like that, but rather it says in the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians 6 that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So as we come to know Christ and name Him as Savior and turn from sin, confess Him, we become the temple, the place where the Spirit of God lives and when Jesus came to earth, his body became the, as we often say, we talk about the true and better this and that here in our teaching series, he became the true and better temple because only through Jesus do we experience the presence of God directly. And so the church or the, the gathering of God's people, not this building, but the gathering of us together who name Christ as God's uh, at people, we are the temple and the body of Christ. We gather together as a body of people on Sunday mornings, not because church is a program that we go to to attend, but a community. The church is a community that we together embody as we meet. Again, notice in verse 1 that it says, where the place where God is, it's seen as a place of beauty, of, of rest, of peace, of goodness, of purity, of all that characterizes God. You know, a person's home often says something about them, whether it's elaborate or ornate or, or a very casual or informal home. And so if, you're the, if you are naming Christ, the, the, the home where the Holy Spirit lives, what does your home say? about that person that lives in there, that Christ who lives within. We see in verse 2 the passion here of this writer where he's, we get the feeling that this writer has been somewhat distant from and estranged from uh, the presence of being able to be at the temple, and he's feeling uh, this uh, visceral sense of, of disconnect from meeting with God. And it's a wonderful thing that after 
the, the, the resurrection of Christ and his ascension and his sending of the Spirit that, that, as he said to the disciples, that he would no longer just merely be with them, but he would send the Spirit. The Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost as we name Christ. We're baptized into the body of Christ. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. We have God who lives in us. So we don't have really the same one-to-one kind of distance thing that's there unless we make it a distance thing. We can be thankful that uh, this never is our experience, that we're estranged, really, in, in a sense, from God. And though we may often feel far from God, though it may seem at times that, that God is, is, is not active and, and, and personally in our lives as at other times, so we know that the Scriptures teach that He is with us and in us. So what is it then to have a heart for God? Well, again, that's a difficult thing to describe. I would describe it as sort of a default drive that we turn to, particularly in times of crisis, which life seems to bring upon us often in abundance. What's our first thought in the time of difficulty? Is it to trust ourselves and our own resources to work things out? Is it our default thing to turn to God? Is it to worry or to to be dependent upon him? And when things go well, is it to be proud or to be thankful for the the spirit and the presence of God that makes it all possible? And when faced with decisions, is it to trust ourselves and rely upon our education and experiences and resources, or is it, again, our default to rely on him? When we make choices about time and resources, is it to prioritize God or to prioritize rather things that are merely the stuff of the flesh and of this world, which is actually that which pulls us in an opposite direction from having a real heart for the things of God? Reading on in verses 3 and 4, it says, Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. The, The psalmist here, the writer here, admires those who get to kind of always be right there where God is. He thinks of the birds that probably inhabited up in, in the rafters of the temple and had their nests and their places there. Uh, the temple apparently had these birds that built these nests in, in, in the, the lofty areas of, of this building, which I'm sure wasn't like an airtight type of, of structure. And so he looks at them, birds that were in, in kind of the bird world. These were the dregs of the bird world, and yet they were right there at the presence of God, and he admires their proximity to God. In verse 4, he speaks of those who work there, the temple priests. This would be specifically the, the family of Aaron, the, the priest, the original priest, the brother of, of Moses and his descendants, who were the priestly uh, workers who, who actually had their responsibilities of life, have them right there where God was, and he admired them, and what a, what a wonderful opportunity it was for them, and, and how great that would be. But you know, familiarity breeds contempt in the natural heart of man. It usually does. When we have privilege, we tend to grow accustomed to it. We know that that happened over the years with those who, who worked close to God and in his house, and so I would have you understand that You know, God doesn't live like here in this building in any special way versus wherever it is that that you are. Isn't that a great thing that God is with you just as much as he's here with us? I mean, it's powerful that we're here together with with the Spirit of God that lives in each of us. And so, uh, you know, Trent and Dave and Chris and... um, Tim and I, I mean, we work here, but God isn't here in any extra special way. But it's special that we are here and that we are here together. That's what makes it special, that we are the temple and together. And if we do not value God's presence with us and the opportunity and the special nature of that, we become like these priests who became complacent due to their familiarity with uh, close proximity to the Lord it says in verse 5, Blessed are those who strengthen as you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. This is one of the great verses, I think, of Scripture. It's one of my most favorite verses in all of Scripture, though the meaning of it is a bit obscure. The words are difficult to translate over from uh, the original Hebrew language into the English text. 
The word pilgrimage is not exactly the, the word that we may think of in, when we say the English word pilgrimage. A more literal, literal way of putting some English words to the saying would be to say, blessed is the one who has set his heart upon making pathways in the heart. The idea of cutting channels, a pathway through the, the heart and soul of who we are that we will connect with God. It's sort of, you know the verse in, in Isaiah, uh, verse 40, uh, chapter 40, verses 3 and 4, where it says, Make straight in the desert a highway, every valley lifted, mountain made low, and all of that. And, of course, John the Baptist is you know, referenced with that in the New Testament. That idea, of course, looked to um, when a visiting monarch would come from, a, from another place, another country, to visit on an official royal visit. They would go out and they would smooth the road through which the visiting monarch would come to visit, to prepare, to make straight the paths, to take out, fill in the valleys, to pull down the mountains, the, the idea of a, of a straight highway. And so it speaks of our hearts as that having a heart for God is that's what we do, is we make the, who we truly are at our, the core of who we are, people who are interested in making a path for God that we may be pilgrims who follow him. So we could sort of translate it, happy is the person who finds his strength in God because he has made in his heart a highway of connection with God. Verse 6, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they will make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. This is picturing a, a sort of some of the arid places that the pilgrims would be going as they would go to, the, to Jerusalem. There would be arid places, but there would, the waters would pool there, there would be springs there, and there would be places of refreshment, even in difficult areas and times. And so a person who has a connection with God even in dry times, has that resource because they've made that pathway, they've made that connection, they have these resources that will sustain them through difficult times. Verse 7, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. And so the person who's made a place of connection with God will not be undone in the desert times, in the valleys of life, when medical crises intervene in our lives or in the lives of those close to us, when disappointment happens with hopes and dreams that we have, when jobs are lost or financial challenges disrupt the natural ebb and flow of life, or when relationships disappoint and we're sad in whatever circumstance of life, we're not ultimately undone because we have that highway of connection and to God and the resources of refreshment from him which leads to a prayer of the psalmist saying, Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Really, verse 9 is a prayer for the king and for the nation. The shield, speaking of the sovereign, the national emblem of the nation, the anointed one being, being the king. That may seem out of context in the psalm, but the prayer here of the, the writer is, is that God's hands would intervene as well into the affairs of the times in which we lived, he lived. Now, we don't know where and when exactly this psalmist wrote. Perhaps it was a time of national difficulty with surrounding nations. That's always been true of Israel and is true to this day. But the person with a heart for God, here's the point to take away, is a person who brings God because he has a highway of connection, because he has resources of refreshment in difficult times. As he sees his world around and the difficulties of it, in his prayer brings God into the circumstances and the difficulties of life. And certainly in the kinds of times in which we live, we can see how that is a timeless truth for us to apply today. And then the scriptures end here in verse in chapter uh, 84, the Psalm, Psalm 84. The final verse is, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. And the whole idea of this is it's better to be a simple person in a right place than to be a big person in the wrong place. The wrong place being out in the world. Let me get a couple little quick pictures. Would you rather live in a little cottage in Williamsport or in a mansion on the San Andreas Fault? Which would you choose? Would you rather drive a Hyundai that is safe 
or a Mercedes with a steering wheel held together by duct tape? Would you rather be in the ocean in a motorboat that's secure and works or in a yacht with a big leak in the hull? The amazing thing, though, is that the majority of people in our world choose not the safe option, not the wise option, not the place of simplicity yet safety in God, but rather the dangerous, unsafe mansions and cars and sinking ships of the world in which we live, a world that's going to burn in the end, but a world that promotes a tasty poison as its drink of choice for the good life that allegedly satisfies the soul, but it never, never does. And so as we, even today, turn our focus to to finish a, a time of communion together, my encouragement to us all is to learn early on that there is no satisfaction apart from that highway of pilgrimage of connection with God. I see so many people who name Christ yet function and dabble with the alleged satisfaction granting um, proclivities of, and pleasures of this world. So I ask, are you really convinced? Are you convinced yet that your only contentment will ultimately come from a daily relationship with God through Christ? Are you really convinced of that? And when you trust in Christ, there really is nothing else that you need to get at that point, some extra baptism of the Spirit thing, some, some whatever thing that you don't quite yet have. You have it all. The question is, at, at salvation, when you trust in Christ, the question is, is will you plug into that? Will you make channels of, of operation and flow and communication with what is in you by the Spirit of God living in you? So I do believe that there is a time in every person's life, and for many people, because their life is coming from a very disturbed direction, it is at the moment of salvation that this happens. But there is a law, uh, somewhere a commitment to go a different way and to walk in firm connection with the Lord. A time in a person's life where they make a real commitment of heart and soul to a life to be a committed disciple of following the Lord. And I believe that's what this psalm is talking about. That's what it talks about, about having the heart of a pilgrim, of making pathways of connection with God. And then in this way, you go from victory to victory in life and find sufficient oases that take you through the inevitable desert experiences. And those places of refreshment include, among them, being in a regular way connected together in a group and in a place of gathering with folks like you're gathered with today to be and to embody God's people together, to be his people, not to do a program, but to be his people. And so church and faith is something that you, that you are more than something that you go to do, but you can't actually go and do it alone. You're not made to do it alone. And in the theme of today, you don't become a Lego. You are a Lego. You are a Lego piece. And by yourself, you're just an isolated little brick with some bumps sticking on you. But when you come and you bring yourself and you bring your bumps and you get together with other Lego pieces together, we can be something bigger together for God's glory As it says in Ephesians 2, consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief Lego piece, cornerstone rather. In in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a Lego, a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So as we go to the communion tables today, there's two at the front, there's two at the back, and, and in just a moment, we'll, we'll go there as families or groups, or if you want to do it individually, if you go in groups, someone uh, kind of lead in prayer and reflection on the work of Christ for us. There are three things, one of three things you need to do today if you've never become a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've never turned from sin and accepted him and said, I need to trust in Christ for salvation. Do that today. But those of you who know Christ, have you ever had a major moment of decision where you say, from this point forward, I will be 
a follower of Christ. And I will make that the major defining commitment of my life. Have you ever had that moment in your life? Perhaps it happened at salvation. Perhaps it happened at some other point along the way, at a conference or in a crisis moment in your life. But there was there a time where you said, I'm really going to go after the Lord from this point forward, come what may. That's a second choice that maybe some of you would need to make today. And if neither of those, then it's this one, where you recommit to that commitment that you have previously made, to the salvation that you have, to the commitment to follow Christ. You recommit today, together with other fellow believers in and around you, to be his body and to serve together for his glory in this place as we gather in the body of Christ. Father, we thank you for what you've given us in Christ, that we are a building built up together in you. Thank you for that great sacrifice as we memorialize it together today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.